Good evening. This is Forum Daily for Friday, November 25th. I'm Nathaniel Duick, filling in for Nima Rajan. We begin the newscast tonight in Ottawa, where the Prime Minister appeared today at the final hearing of the Public Order Emergency Commission's inquiry investigating the decision to invoke the Emergencies Act. Justin Trudeau says he was absolutely serene and confident in his decision to invoke the Act. He says he made the right decision, painting a picture of Canada teetering on the edge of violence during the convoy protests. Mr. Trudeau was the final witness to testify at the inquiry investigating the federal government's use of the act to clear blockades in Ottawa and at several border crossings. Well, in what is likely to be relief for parents across the country, the federal health minister says imports of children's pain relievers are already hitting pharmacy shelves, with more expected over the next few weeks. Jean-Yves Duclos made the announcement during a briefing in Ottawa today. He says domestic production is also on the rise, with a record number of units being produced to help deal with the shortages. Mr. Duclos says a million units of imported pain relievers are hitting shelves, and an additional 500,000 units have been ordered. Well, in other medical news, doctors are concerned that seniors will be the next wave of patients hospitalized with a respiratory illness, RSV. Pediatric hospitals have been treating large numbers of young patients for RSV in recent weeks, and the virus's high rates are also putting seniors at risk. Health Canada says it's reviewing a potential vaccine to protect seniors against the virus. The Canada Research Chair in Aging and Immunity is recommending that Canadians wear masks and do not visit older loved ones while feeling unwell to help stop the spread of RSV to seniors. While the Prairie Provinces are speaking out against a proposal by the federal Liberals to expand the definition of what firearms should be included in gun control legislation. Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba said in a joint release that such a change would criminalize hunters, farmers, and target shooters. Liberals say their proposed definition of a prohibited assault-style firearm applies only to guns that belong on the battlefield. Opposition Conservative MPs say the federal move would outlaw large numbers of ordinary hunting rifles and shotguns. The Quebec government says it will appeal a decision that disabled random police stops in the province. Public Security Minister Francois Bonnardel says the appeal is because random police stops can be an important tool for police and that it is unacceptable to deprive cops of that ability. Last month, a Quebec Superior Court justice found that a common law rule allowing police to stop motorists without suspicion that an offense has been committed paves the way for racial profiling. The federal government posted a surplus of $1.7 billion during the first few six months of the current fiscal year. This is a massive turnaround from the $68.6 billion deficit reported for the same period last year. Program expenses dropped by $40.3 billion, or 17.9%, largely due to the expiration of COVID-19 support measures. But higher interest rates and inflation have driven up the cost of public debt charges by 47.8%, or $5.6 billion compared to the same period last year. On the West Coast, BC also posted a financial surplus. Faster-than-expected economic recovery has pushed British Columbia's operating surplus to $5 billion more than estimated in the last quarter. Finance Minister Selena Robinson says much of the added surplus comes from higher personal and corporate income taxes, while sales tax and natural gas royalties were also higher. Ms. Robinson says $2 billion of the added revenue has already been earmarked for cost-of-living measures announced since the summer. Well, on the other side of the country, a Halifax bike shop says it is paying its staff a living wage, and that has helped the business succeed. Cyclesmith's owner, Andrew Feenstra, says the shop pays its 31 full-time staff members $23.50 an hour. Nova Scotia's minimum wage is currently $13.60 an hour. Mr. Feenstra says the higher wages means that the shop has no problems retaining staff, and business is thriving as a result. Well, as FIFA World Cup games continue to be played, the tournament is bringing a welcome surge in traffic to restaurants and bars. Payment provider Moneris predicts the World Cup will kick off a surge in spending at bars and restaurants. Well, on the topic of sales, Black Friday is officially here. And one retail analyst says the rising cost of living will intensify the hunt for deals today. Bruce Winder says he expects sales to be strong, even though some of the urgency of lining up at stores early in the morning has been diluted. This as retailers have increasingly stretched deals over several weeks and offered similar discounts online. But he says decades high inflation will lead customers to cherry pick sales, with stores featuring blowout sales being busier than those with lower discounts. 
Well, Forum Daily will be right back after a break with a look at energy prices. We'll be joined by Dan McTeague, Senior Petroleum Analyst at GasWizard.ca. After that, we'll have news from around the world, as well as an update on cryptocurrencies. So stay with us. Forum Daily will be right back in a moment. Welcome back. Up now, Forum Daily's weekly energy update with Dan McTeague, Senior Petroleum Analyst at GasWizard.ca. Take it away, Dan. Well, thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, what a couple of weeks we are, have been seeing here on energy markets, and it has pretty wide implications, I think, for not just production of energy, but also, of course, the cost of energy. Uh, who would have thought at the beginning of the year when oil was moving towards $100 a barrel that it would suddenly turtle, uh, go backwards and pushed down towards $77 a barrel, despite the fact that uh, on the basis of fundamentals, the so-called supply and demand, uh, you know, oil is still pretty tight and demand destruction has not taken place. The world still needs more energy and it's uh, countries like Canada that are not stepping up to the plate, uh, not able to step up to the plate primarily because of, of course, uh, pipeline hijinks and regulations of the government that's determined to ensure we somehow figure out different ways. Maybe uh, we can use heat pumps uh, to keep our economy going. I'm kidding, of course, but that seems to be the policy in Ottawa these days. Energy prices have dropped. Uh, they've dropped an average of about five cents a liter this week. Uh, in places like Toronto, you're paying about $1.52. It's going to remain that way for a good part of the week, uh, mostly because the United States is, uh, you know, is celebrating the Thanksgiving long weekend. And that means, of course, no market activity. What little activity there is there is pretty uh, muted and uh, very, very light trading. Uh, so the same, of course, for Montreal, uh, which is seeing prices in the in the range of $1.67. The Maritimes, which have seen prices drop about 10 cents a litre over the past week or two, are also enjoying prices they haven't seen since the end of September. So we're looking there at prices in the 180, 175 range. That's true for Halifax. Uh, and New Brunswick uh, and, of course, Newfoundland, PEI, continues to uh, follow uh, the other Atlantic provinces. We go a little further west. Um, we are seeing a bit of a divergence in provinces like Alberta, where the Premier Daniel Smith has announced a permanent suspension of the, uh, of the provincial tax. It looks like uh, that will make and continue to have Albertans smiling uh, as uh, their diesel and gasoline prices remain uh, by far and away the lowest in the country. Not far behind, of course, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, which have not followed a similar path. Uh, we're still seeing gas prices there in the $1.65 range, $1.60, $1.65, whereas in Alberta, they're in the dollar, upper $1.30s. Dollar uh, for British Columbia, especially the interior, uh, it seems that gas stations are doing very well there. They're not responding to any of the drops we've seen on energy markets, and uh, gasoline price is still stubbornly in the 165 to 173 range. They can probably come down another $0.10 cents a litre, uh, and that'll make uh, gas stations just as profitable. Uh, the reality is that retail margins there, sticky retail margins, is really to blame, whether you're in Kelowna, whether you happen to be in Kamloops, uh, whether you happen to be in Prince George. As for Vancouver itself, looking at almost record prices. I mean, uh, if you consider that, uh, you know, the dollar uh, 71 to dollar, I'm just looking at the numbers here, dollar 69 are prices we haven't seen in over a year and a half. It's a bit of a benefit, and it uh, does suggest at the end of the day, what is driving these prices lower uh, is uh, an obsession by markets, not physical traders of oil and gas, but in fact, financial speculators over lockdowns in, in China, demand destruction, inflation, the, you know, the laundry list goes on. The problem with all of this, Nathaniel, is that we are looking at a scenario where energy prices are going to come back dramatically and very rapidly once the world realizes, especially with the colder winter, uh, and now besetting not just uh, Europe, but North America, that we're going to have a significant draw on limited supplies. Uh, I suspect that by October the, uh, sorry, December the 5th, uh, OPEC will meet. They are not going to change their commitment to drop uh, oil uh, production uh, by 2 million barrels a day. That too will have an impact. And, you know, we're really running out of excuses uh, globally as to why we would want to see prices for energy drop at a time in which there seems to be a continuation of an energy crisis, if, if you will, a scarcity uh, in, in production. Uh, borrowing oil, as the United States is doing with their, through its strategic petroleum reserve, looking for alternatives like <clears throat> going on bended knee to Venezuela, as the Biden administration is doing, it's only going to make the situation not geopolitically 
uh, impractical. Uh, it's likely to lead to a, a very risky situation as far as energy prices are concerned. For the forecast for the week ahead, I'm not seeing much of a change. What you see is pretty much what you're going to get. We'll be back at you again next week, Nathaniel, uh, for the uh, weekly update. Well, thank you, Dan. Lots to keep in mind this week. Again, that was Dan McTeague, Senior Petroleum Analyst at GasWizard.ca. He is also the President of Canadians for Affordable Energy. Well, stay with us. When we come back from the break, we'll be moving from the energy industry to the realm of cryptocurrencies. Our weekly crypto and digital asset update with Catherine Murray is up next. The host of The Buck Stops here will take us through the biggest developments this week. So stay tuned. We'll be right back on Forum Daily with your crypto update. Welcome back. Up now, Form Daily's weekly crypto and digital asset update with Catherine Murray, host of The Buck Stops Here. All yours, Catherine. Nathaniel, hello everyone, and welcome to your weekly crypto and digital asset update. I am Catherine Murray. Well, we are seeing Bitcoin trade down by about 1% week over week to around 16,500. But of course, all of the damage to cryptocurrency valuations have been done over the past two weeks following the implosion of FTX. Uh, recall that FTX was the third largest crypto exchange where investors could buy, sell, trade cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, as well as Ether. The valuation of FTX at its peak was about $38 billion. Just to review some of the latest FTX news, because this is still very much the focus within the space, uh, there are reports that FTX businesses owe more than $3 billion to their largest creditors and potentially have over 1 million creditors. That is according to bankruptcy filings. Uh, Reuters has reported that SBF, so Sam Bankman Free, he's known as SBF Online, and his associates own at least 19 properties in the Bahamas with a valuation of nearly $121 million. With, uh, interestingly here, with a branch of FTX purchasing seven beachfront condos for nearly $72 million dollars, in the very upscale community of Albany within the Bahamas. Um, according to another report, Sam Bankman Freed at his peak was worth about $26 billion. That was just earlier this year. So how things can change. According to Coinbase, despite the crypto winter, and I'll use my words here, was it going to be an ice age? Apparently not, according to them. Um, they did a survey that found 62% uh, of investors or increasing allocations to digital assets. But of course, that survey was done before the collapse of FTX. But interestingly, we are continuing to see institutions support the digital asset world. JP Morgan has officially registered a cryptocurrency wallet trademark. You've also heard within the cryptocurrency custody space that we are seeing increased competition custodies are in charge of making sure we've got the complete records of who owns what. We actually saw back in October, BNY Mellon uh, moving into this area and launching a platform going live in the U.S. That was in October. And also, interestingly here, globally, you are seeing uh, the Bank of Japan and top J Japanese banks beginning trials of a digital yen that will take place next year. The plan apparently is to work with private sector banks uh, to test deposits and withdrawals from various accounts. Lastly, with respect to the regulatory aspect of cryptocurrencies, of course, there's been a huge call for more regulation, not even more, some regulation uh, that may have prevented what we saw with respect to FTX and so many people, institutions, very well-known institutions such as Sequoia, also, of course, the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund losing money because of FTX and, of course, the small retail players as well, uh, having a ma ma massive impact on so many people. There's been a call for regulation. Perhaps if we had some, maybe this would not have taken place. Interestingly here, some regulators in the United States, U.S. prosecutors, in fact, actually opened up a probe of FTX months before its collapse. Nathaniel, I'll leave it there. Back to you. Again, thanks for that, Catherine. That was Catherine Murray, host of The Buck Stops Here, which airs Sundays at 9 a.m. Eastern, only on the News Forum Network. Well, we are moving now from the digital world to one of the biggest names in online commerce. 
Former Amazon.com workers and labor organizers have time to visit to two of the e-commerce giant's locations in Lachine, Quebec today during the busy Black Friday period. The visit is part of the global Make Amazon Pay movement. It is urging the company to pay fair wages, taxes, and better account for its impact on the environment. Workers in at least 30 countries, including the U.S. and U.K., have taken issue with salaries allegedly decreasing. This while Amazon rakes in record revenue, pays no income tax in Europe, and saw its carbon emissions rise by 18% last year. Amazon says it knows it's not perfect in any area, but people who look at it objectively will see it takes its role and impact in the world seriously. Well, Elon Musk is, again, planning to relaunch Twitter's premium service. This time, he is offering different colored check marks to accounts after a previous attempt backfired. Twitter previously suspended the premium service, which added a blue check label to anyone paying $8 a month because of a wave of imposter accounts. In the latest version, companies will get a gold check, governments will get a gray check, and individuals who pay for the service, whether they're celebrities or not, will get a blue check. Well, we'll be right back after the break. Stay with us. A barrage of missiles has struck the recently liberated Ukrainian city of Kherson in a marked escalation of attacks since Russia withdrew two weeks ago. At least four people were killed in the strikes, which began yesterday and continued throughout the night. Authorities in the region had warned that Kherson would face intensified strikes as Russian troops dig in across the Dnieper River. Well, as that conflict continues, NATO says it is determined to help Ukraine defend itself against Russia for as long as it takes. The alliance says that it will work with Ukraine to ensure its military is up to Western standards. Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg made the vow while speaking with reporters ahead of a meeting with foreign ministers in Romania next week. Well, moving from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to a potential transatlantic trade issue. The European Union and United States are treading precariously close to a major trade dispute. EU trade ministers are insisting they would be forced to respond if Washington sticks to all the terms of its Inflation Reduction Act. The act is favorable to local companies through subsidies. The EU says it will unfairly discriminate against its firms that want to compete for contracts. The dispute comes at a time when the two Western giants want to show unity in the face of challenges from Russia and China. Well, the death toll continues to rise from an earthquake that struck Indonesia's Java Island early this week. It has risen to 310 after rescuers found more bodies under landslides. Officials estimate that at least 24 people are missing. Residents gathered near badly damaged mosques for Friday prayers, while others held prayers along with rescuers between tents at evacuation centers. Buildings collapsed as Monday's quake brought tons of mud, rocks, and broken trees down into residential areas. China's capital city is facing uncertainty and turmoil amid a surge in COVID-19 cases. Residents of Beijing are panic buying and overwhelming delivery apps, while officials have ordered the accelerated construction of quarantine centers and field hospitals. Daily cases of COVID-19 are hitting records across China, with almost 33,000 cases reported on Friday alone. The uncertainty and scattered, unconfirmed reports of lockdowns in some Beijing districts have fueled the panic buying. Moving to political turmoil in France, where President Emmanuel Macron is denying that he was the focus of a judicial investigation into suspected illegal financing of electoral campaigns in 2017 and 2022. The comments come after leading French newspaper, La Parisienne, first reported on the probe. Mr. Macron says he has nothing to fear from the investigation and that he wasn't its main focus. He says he learned about the investigation through the press. A UN team of experts says the Taliban treatment of women and girls in Afghanistan may amount to a crime against humanity. They add it should be investigated and prosecuted under international law. Friday's statement by the UN-appointed experts followed a confirmation from the Taliban that three women were among 12 people lashed on Wednesday in front of hundreds of spectators at a provincial sports stadium. It signaled the Taliban's resumption of a brutal form of punishment that was a hallmark of their rule in the 1990s. The UN experts said the latest Taliban actions have deepened existing rights violations already the most draconian globally. Well, as anti-government protesters demand rights for women in Iran, the country's political turmoil appears to be spilling over into the World Cup. 
pro-government fans harassed anti-government fans outside the stadium in Qatar. Some Iran fans confiscated Persian pre-revolutionary Iranian flags from supporters entering the stadium and shouted insults at those wearing shirts with the slogan of the country's protest movement, Woman, Life, Freedom. Many women fans were visibly shaken as Iranian government supporters surrounded them with national flags and filmed them on their phones. Well, back in China, a court in Beijing has sentenced Chinese-Canadian pop star Chris Wu to 13 years in prison on charges including rape. The June trial of the former member of the South Korean group EXO was closed to the public to protect the alleged victim's privacy. The court says Mr. Wu was sentenced for a 2020 rape and for a 2018 incident in which he and others allegedly assaulted two women they had gotten drunk. Well, as FIFA's World Cup continues in Qatar, the unofficial soundtrack of the tournament is fast becoming the incessant chanting of street marshals, better known as last mile marshals. Seated all over Doha on high lifeguard-style chairs, the migrant workers point visitors flooding into the country in the right direction on their search for public transportation. It's an important crowd control measure as some 1.2 million fans are expected to inundate the emirate, a country home to 3 million people. Well, I'm Nathaniel Duick, filling in for Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. For more news on demand, you can visit our website at thenewsforum.ca and make sure to follow us on our social media handles. We're available on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Well, take care, Canada. We'll see you again next time on Forum Daily.